you know, I, and I was insecure for many years. You know, in my 20s, I, building all the businesses I built was really out of response for trying to prove to the world I was good enough. You know, look, you know, will you love me now? Because now I have three companies. Or no, no, I still feel unloved, so now I'll build four companies. What about now? Am I good enough now? You know, I, I work with guys in, in the Middle East, in, in the Far East, that uh, it's worth $700 million that are miserable as hell because they're not a billionaire. You know, the, the, the goalposts keep moving. They're, they set the frame up. You know, to, to love yourself for where you're at, to be okay where you're at as a starting point and understand that everybody that where they are got to where they are from being where they were at. If you want to build a business, there are a lot of people that can help guide you. But if you want to get guidance on how to build a thriving business while also learning how to build healthy relationships with others and with yourself, and you also want to strengthen your spiritual health and your physical vitality, then Peter Sage is your one-stop go-to resource. Extreme entrepreneur and athlete, philanthropist, speaker, best-selling author, and philosopher, Peter Sage is a man with big ideas, big success, big dreams, and big insights. But what ties all of Peter's successes and teachings together is his really, really big heart and his commitment to being of service. Peter has every reason to have a big ego. He's done a lot with his life, a whole lot. A visit to his website reveals a very full life of boundless enthusiasm, energy, adventures, and experiences. But what I really appreciate about Peter's work is that while it is primarily geared towards helping people build hugely successful businesses, the core of all of his work is clearly to help people build grounded, heart-centered, and fulfilling lives. A tireless font of passion, humor, energy, focus, and genuine care, Peter takes his numerous talents and applies them earnestly to help others birth develop, and expand upon their own unique and precious gifts. I'm Chess Edwards, and this is Beyond the Noise, conversations at the heart of modern day living. I interviewed Peter Sage in May of 2015. So, hello, Peter. Hi, Chess. I'm so glad you're here. Thank you for taking the time. Absolute pleasure. Always great to be able to come onto a medium where we can uh, discuss ideas about life, the universe, and everything. Yeah. Well, I, I got to say, I got um, I got turned on to your work. You know, somewhere out in the universe, right? I was guided to to the work that you do, and um, I was really turned on by the the breadth of work that that you do in regards to helping people further their their dreams, their business dreams, their entrepreneurial desires. But as as where al- I find a lot of people, that's the only message they're they're really giving. You know, you can make your next million, and you can build a big business, and you know that's that's of great value. But what I really appreciate about what I saw in your work was you're giving such weight and and attention as well to, you know, what is it to be human? You know, what mm. is it to show up in our in our vulnerability and in the truth of who we are. Um, that we can build businesses upon. So you're really doing a lot of the foundational work is, is helping people be good human beings as well. Oh, thank, thank you, Jess. I appreciate that. I, I tend to call it enlightened entrepreneurship. Oh, sweet. Okay, great. Well, see, that's perfect because one of my first questions was, you know, what for somebody like you who deals with a, a large breadth of work and a different way of approaching the, the human experience, you know, my question was, you know, what is your elevator speech you know how, how do you how do you encompass and cap uh, encapsulate what it is you do um so in in enlightened entrepreneurship yes i mean i've i've had the tagline for a while of being the extreme entrepreneur which was kind of given to me uh in light of some of the the, the crazy things that i've done in the past both you know sort of business and non-business you know whether it's charging across ultra marathons or building you know businesses that have a um a, an out of world reach and, and all of that but really the the challenge with being an extreme entrepreneur one is that not everybody wants to be extreme you know that there's a kind of 
uh, of forcefulness around that as a kind of you know, commitment to that that a lot of people are, are turned off by. And it's great to see those people that we tend to like to throw on pedestals and, and give them that like, kind of spotlight. But it's not really what it's about. For, for me, you know, business has always been about uh, a vehicle to be expressed the best of who we are. And that's just one different avenue of being able to do it. But I see so many business owners that get caught up in being too busy being busy for all the wrong reasons that I, I like to, to merge my, my main passion alongside business, which is understanding people and human behavior and put it into a context so that it gives meaning to both. And, and therefore, business isn't just the, the domain of capitalists to run around and, and make more at the expense of other people or, or to you know, destroy the planet. And, and spirituality isn't this just sort of airy fairy thing that commit, you know, sort of commits people to a life of, of not being able to express abundance financially. So being able to bring the two together, I, I tend to call it enlightened entrepreneurship because really that, that's what it is. That's, that's how it unifies the, both the spiritual and the commercial aspects in, in one place. Well, and, and you know, who are the people who really are helping make such a huge difference in the world? You know, we all do so in our ways, but when you have a very successful business and you have influence and, and you have some wealth behind that to be able to make, you know, conscious choices about how you want to support the world with that wealth, what a powerful place uh, to be in. Hundred percent, because because my, but people mainly don't understand money. That's my experience. They don't understand what it is. They don't understand the the energetic principles behind it, uh, or it's confusing, or it's too yeah sort of uh, too much of a gray area, too much la di da and airy fairiness around it to, to make it practical in in day to day living. And and when you start to understand that that money is nothing more than a byproduct or a consequence of how much value you can add, you can start to understand it from a slightly different perspective. And yeah, there's obviously a lot more to it than, than just uh, paying lip service to that. But you know, if you are in a position where you have a huge amount of personal you know, choices, options, wealth, you, know, you can do a lot more with that in terms of contributing to the greater good. And yeah, it's always said that money is a magnifier. It makes you more of who you are. If you're going to be generous, money will make you more generous. You know, if you're, you're a tight, money will make you more tight. If you're an idiot, money will make you a bigger idiot. That's, <laughs> yeah, that, that, that's just the nature. It, it's, it allows us more options to magnify who we are or the patterns that we run uh, at our core. So you know, saying that money's a, a dirty word or you know, people used to quote, oh, well, the, uh, money's the root of all evil. Well, the, the actual translation out of the, or the etymology of that particular phrase was the love of money is the root of all evil. And the reason that sentence, I believe, came about was because a lot of people make the mistake, Chess, of, of confusing their self-worth with their net worth. And if you tie your self-worth and your net worth together, then anything that threatens your net worth, opportunity, business deals, anything that comes along that you filter through a potential you know, worst case scenario, you're going you're gonna to start to compromise your values around decisions on money so that it doesn't affect your self-worth and trigger the fear that you're not enough, which is the primary fear most people have. So that's really where a lot of people have a bad association to money. Um, they just have either a low self-worth and therefore it's easier to justify why they don't want to have the courage to be able to swing the bat at life. Or you, know, you have a situation where you know, they've, they've been compromised by the integrity of others around you know, deals or situations they've been let down on or ripped off on because those other people, uh, rather than face a lower self-worth, which would trigger the fear they're not enough, which most people would do almost anything to avoid having to feel, you know, they would rather just compromise their values around money and then go back on their word or not fulfill their promise. So yeah, you know, there's a lot of other stuff we can we can talk on that, but in a nutshell, that's really where a lot of the, the bad rap comes from in terms of understanding around money. Well, and that's why I wanted to have this conversation today with you, and because that's so much in alignment with um, the the work that I do with my clients and and what motivates me, and what have been some of my own struggles in the past. You know, that idea of you know, do I create a world around me that validates me, that gives me a sense of who I am, or do I first discover the truth of who I am and then apply that to building building the life that I want to lead. It's it's a big chicken and egg that not many people make the conscious dis, uh, choice on on what comes first. No, well, we're not surrounded by a whole lot of great examples of that, are we? 
unfortunately not. Although it is changing, you know, we we, we see that there are more avenues uh, and people like yourself, Chess, who have a uh, a commitment to wanting to to spread the word, not because you're trying to look good or build up a, a viewership to try and justify a significant you know, ego trip on ratings, but because you generally have a passion for wanting to spread uh, information that can help people and change their lives. And, and I'm I'm very much in tune with that. Thank you. Well, I got that from you. I appreciate that. And so one of the questions I, I'm curious about for you is, you know, currently, you know, what is one of your real motivating purposes? And another way perhaps to ask that is of all the programs that you do and the different ways that you, you touch people and reach people and communicate, um, what is currently thrilling you the most? Well, I thank you for asking the question. I'm, I'm kind of smiling as I, I contemplate the answer because it is a real congruent sense of, of where I'm at right now. Now, I've spent the last quarter of a century building what I would call traditional businesses. You know, some of them have been great. Some of them have failed majestically. Some have cost me an investor's money. Some have made me an investor's money and, and everything in between. And, and that's been a journey. It's been a ride. It's been a, a playground. It's been a, a, an expensive college lesson. And it's been yeah, a, a lot of everything in between. But where I've come over the last you know, short while has been far more focused on tuning into you know, the, the truth, you know, the gut feel, the, the intuition, whatever you want to call it. And that is to tell me that, look, I've, I've made so many mistakes and that I've, I've you know, fortunately made you know, so many good choices as well over the years that you know, there's, there's a lot of insight that I can help other people with. And being back on stage as a teacher uh, is really where my calling is right now. You know, I'm, I'm blessed to get you know, dozens of messages every day from people around the world who I've never met that have said, oh, you know, thank you for your YouTube video. Thank you for you know, the, the podcast. Thank you for, for something that they managed to take out. Uh, and I'm sure it's the same with yourself, Jay. That's, that's what keeps me doing what I do right now is being able to add value to people around the world in a way that you know, never before in human history have we been able to do that allows you instantaneously to touch thousands of people's lives for the better and, and hopefully leave a little ripple of contribution in, in the pond or the river of life. Uh, and that's, that's where I'm at. I've, I've got a, a certain gift uh, that I'm able to, to give in business and, and personal development as a way to combine those to become more of who we are through that expression. You know, I teach that in, in my flagship uh, three-day event. I have something called a millionaire business school. Uh, and when I teach the millionaire business school, I market it as a millionaire business school because that's the what everybody thinks they're under the illusion that they want to become. Right, you got to meet you got to meet them where they are. Right. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And it's it's great. I, I just did a, a an MBS in Johannesburg. Uh, I've got another one coming up in London next month, and you know, I love the event because everybody comes there thinking, you know, teach me how to make a million, and I, and I can do that. I can teach you that in your sleep. Yeah, that, that's <laughs> it's not difficult these days to go out and create financial abundance in a in an economy in a marketplace that has so much opportunity and so uh, less of a barrier to entry than there, there's ever been before. But yeah, you know, most people come in thinking that's the goal, and the entire first day, I teach nothing about business. It's all about holding up a mirror to discover who you are. And that's my favorite day. You know, again, I could teach business, you know, in, in my sleep, but exposing people to the greatness of who they are and getting them in touch with that in a way that really shifts them emotionally, spiritually, you know, practically, so that then they can go out and apply what it is that they want. And, you know, and I have people come in as business partners coming in to want to you know, double their business, which, you know, again, is one of the promises of what we teach. And you know, at the end of the first day, they shake hands and part company, and it's an amicable, beautiful, you know, energetically you know, uh, pleasant arrangement because they realize they're in it for the wrong reasons. Yeah, and that is, I'm so glad to hear you say that because I know that there are so many – uh, workshops and opportunities out there where the promise is, you know, you're, you're, we're going to help you build, build this, uh, a life of great abundance. And, but without that foundational piece that says, you know, if you're chasing abundance for your sense of self-worth, that is never going to serve. That is always no. going to leave you feeling empty at the end of the day, and you can throw as much at it as you want, and that hole is always going to be empty and probably even even grow uh, as you go. And I imagine you, Peter, I can hear it in your voice and in your enthusiasm. I imagine you walking out on that stage, and your last thought is about how well am I going to perform or how how well is this – how many people do I have in my audience? How much is this going to serve me? That it is really 100% – about helping others be more true to who they are. 
Well, I'll be honest, yes. Uh, yes, but it certainly wasn't always that case. You know, the, the, the journey is always part of the uh, game. Yeah, and, yeah. You know, B- Buddha wasn't born enlightened. And I, people ask me, you know, I, I get a, a lot of, uh, I'm very grateful and humbled to, to get a lot of, of great feedback when I get on stage in front of large audiences. You know, it's, uh, uh, it, it's really a, a way for me to demonstrate the fact that I've made a connection, which is great. You know, uh, but people say, how, how do you be able to create so much connection on stage? And I say to them, well, you know, if you really want to be a great speaker, then let me let me share with you in in yeah, sixty seconds more than you'll probably learn in a year at Toastmasters, because you know, when I first got on stage, as as all of us in in the industry tend to follow, and it's a gross generalization, I don't know everybody, but this this was my path. Uh, you, know, you come on from a place of filtering all of the experience through. How can I get the audience to like me? That's essentially it. How can I get approval? How can I validate my sense of worth on what I'm delivering by the feedback from the audience? And there's a certain part where that has a, its place, but generally speaking, you get stuck in your head because you're filtering everything through that need for validation, approval, yeah, uh, applause, yeah, positive feedback on the forms, whatever it is. And yeah, if you suddenly transition into a different level of consciousness where you go out on stage and I don't care if the audience knows my name. It's not about me. It's, in fact, chances are I want to make them feel uncomfortable because if they're comfortable, they're never going to shift. So I'm there to challenge them on a certain you know, model of the world that they're, uh, they've held true to. And as long as I believe that I'm serving the greater good, I don't need anybody else's good opinion. Yes. And the, the, the paradox with that is that when you go out n- actively not seeking significance – you tend to get more of it by osmosis. Well, you know, I got to say, Peter, I'm, I, you know, I certainly uh, have suffered that and still do at times. You know, I've got to make that shift when I'm speaking to a, to a group in a workshop or an audience that when I am looking at how is this going, you know, how well is this going to go for me? <laughs> <laughs> I lose that connection. And as soon as I switched over and go, oh, that's right. It's about them. It's about mm. being of service. It's about, you know, I have this gift, this opportunity to provide, a, you know, some insight, some sense of, of what I've learned in the world. And it's not about the approval. It's about them. And, and even willing to be unpopular in the moment for what you believe will be the long-term greater good that serves them. Yeah. Yeah. But, but Peter, they might not like you. <laughs> <laughs> if, if, that, if that's your outcome, <laughs> buy a dog. Yeah. Well, I... <laughs> Oh, man. And you called, I heard you in one of your videos, you called it the goop, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, most people spend their life swimming in goop, the good opinion of other people. And it's such a, yeah, it's, yeah, it's so inconsistent with being able to uh, allow us to live an authentic life because we become this giant adaptation machine. You know, we're walking around saying, oh, if, if they like me this way, then I'll be this way. But if they like me that way, then I'll be that way. And there's no sense of authenticity because we're constantly trying to match ourselves to the reflection and then you're just chasing yourself in the mirror. Right, with the hope that someday we're going to get it just right. You Which know, never happens. No, it can't. You know, And, and again, you, you talk about... You know, chasing the chasing the money. I, I've I've come to the conclusion over two decades of uh, plus of work that it is absolutely impossible to catch the goal of fulfillment by running on the track of achievement. You know, yeah. you, you're gonna you're gonna run yourself into the ground, and even if it's a temporary score on being able to catch what it was you thought you were chasing, the next goal appears because you're in that level of of permanently conditioning yourself not to be satisfied with where you are. Now, in terms of motivation, that's useful for getting off your your backside and and getting out of the victim mode and uh, and being able to move forward. But if you're doing it to validate your sense of fulfillment rather than as an expression of going out and enjoying life, then you're forever going to be frustrated because you'll think that the answer lies in the next goal or just around the corner or that thing that I've just got to close and it's that close to me, I, I just not going to take my attention off it. And yet we, we never we never understand that it's a perpetual game. You know, if you go back to the 17-year-old you at college and tell that person who you are now, what you've done, where you've been, what you're earning, what your circumstances have been and the stories you can tell, that 17-year-old version of you would probably think you've made it. Yes. Yes, absolutely. Because it's far beyond what that 17-year-old's imagination was at the time. 
Exactly, and the benchmark was was always it was you know, higher. Now we've smashed through that benchmark for for many of us, but we still don't feel as if we've arrived. Yeah. And there we have the deal. You know, that that's the, the the perpetual hamster wheel to nowhere that most of us spend our life running on and wonder why we're exhausted. So that sense of fulfillment, that you know, that real core question, because it can come for everybody at it, looking a bit different and with a different quality. So what I'm hearing here is that you're not saying by any means, this is the thing that you, this is the, uh, the, the achievement that you need to have. And if once you have this achievement, then you will be fulfilled. You're if, really asking people yeah. for them, what is fulfillment for them and helping guide them to uh, getting out of their own way to allow that to, to manifest. And most people have no clue because they think fulfillment is success and they think success is achieving a certain amount of fill in the blank status, you know, money, finance, net worth, uh, fulfillment, love, you know, finding the right person, you know, having circumstances in the outer world match what I think my inner world pictures tell me they should be. Then I'll give myself permission to be happy. And that's Disneyland thinking. That's a fast track to nowhere. As, as anybody knows, you, you want the, you want the fastest way to unhappiness, then try Two things. One, try to fight reality because I'll guarantee you it keeps winning. Every, only 100% of the time, though. <laughs> you know? And, and the second way is try to get somebody else to be, do, have, or behave in a way that you want them to be, do, or behave. Mm. Uh, and, and that's, that, that's going to screw your model of the world like you wouldn't believe because then mm, if we come to that awareness, most people are faced with the fact that, well, hang on a minute. That means that I can no longer hide behind the excuse of, well, you know, if only they were this way, then I'd be happier. It does put all the responsibility on us, doesn't it? Of course. Which, you know, where else would you want it to be? If it's, if it's not on you, <laughs> you, you can't control it. I would, just right. You're completely screwed. We're abdicating. Otherwise, we're abdicating our lives to others. Yeah. Let, let, let me coin flip and see how well reality treats me. Yes. Yeah. yeah that's, that's no way to live. Not, mm. not when you were given the power of being able to choose your state, being able to choose you know, what sets the game up. You know, it's, and it's not the values, Chess, that most people have. Most people have fairly good modern values. I mean, most people don't go around murdering each other and stealing and what have you. You're going to get a, a few people in society that follow that model because out of desperation or, or you know, just having a, a weird sense of, of right and wrong. Uh, but you know, essentially, most people have a decent set of values. The problem is not in the values. The problem is in the rules that we have around what has to happen in order for us to experience internally those values. To give you a, a very simple example, let's take health. You know, health is a value a lot of people have. You know, unfortunately, not as many as probably should, but yeah, that's just my, my judgments there. Yeah, but health is a great value, and you have two people that value health immensely. But one of them has the game set up that says, you know something, I've got to you know, eat uh, organic food, train in the gym four times a week, have 10% body fat and a resting heart rate of you know, four, you know, whatever it is. <laughs> uh, the, uh, and then I'll choose to feel healthy. And you have other people that say, you know something, I choose to feel healthy when I drink a glass of water. And they have easy access to it. They set up the rules in a way for themselves because nobody voted on those rules and, and apart from us. Now, and a lot of people set up the game so that it's very hard to experience what they most want to experience. And a lot of people have it set up so it's easy to experience what they don't want to experience. You know, rejection. What happens for you to feel rejection? Oh, well, somebody's got to disagree with me. Well, guess what? The chances of that happening are somewhere plus 100%. Yes. Whereas somebody else says, well, I, I don't like rejection either. But, you know, the way I experience rejection is if 50 people within 30 feet of me all reject me within the same 20 minutes, and then I'll choose to feel rejected. <laughs> yeah? yeah, maybe something's going on then. Yeah, you know, right. we'll call that feedback. Right, <laughs> right, right. But, but until then, then yeah, no, because we get to choose the rules of how we set up the game. And most of us are walking around with a set of rules that are picked up from secondhand yeah, uh, rule shops that we outgrew on beliefs that no longer serve us, that we've never re-questioned. And we walk around with a screwed up model of the world, wondering why we're not happy, fulfilled, joyful, and at peace. Because you know, we listen to the news that tells us what has to happen in order for right. it to, 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 you know, for us to give ourselves permission to do that. And, and th there's, no, there's no exit strategy for people out of that game. Well, this brings up an interesting point. I, and I was perusing your, your website, and I will admit, I found myself at one point going, 
wow, look at what Peter's done, right? He's done this, he's done that. It's obviously a boundless amount of energy and enthusiasm and creativity. And, and you know, you're speaking about a life, the true life that you've led. And, and here's a lot of the, the, the uh, um, successes and ways you're showing up in the world. And there was a part of me who, that started to feel a little depressed. <laughs> <laughs> now, I know that's not your intention, but it's right. It's now, but it was just my, what I was doing was I was, I was starting to look at the contrast frame. I was comparing exactly. And I was saying, oh, those are the rules that, that everyone, that everyone plays by. And it's like, no, I, you're right. I get to set up my own rules. So I, I went on a, a walk. I sat in my meditation and then came back to, oh, that's right. Ah, oh, this this is my life, and I get to choose how I lead it, and what's important to me, and what is a value to me. But yeah, I started to compare and started to actually adopt your values rather than to know, really recognize and be honoring of my own values. And, and and well done for catching that, because so many people, and I get people come and say, oh, I, I want to be the next Peter Sage. I'm like, well, I'm so you, you can't because I'm already taken. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, and and I, I while I, I appreciate, I'm humbled by the the complimentary intent. Yeah, the, the only thing that we can do in this world, chess, is be the best example of ourselves that we can be. Case closed. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and the second you start trying to be somebody else's example or better than somebody else or compared to somebody else or this and the other, you step straight off your truth and you start walking a line of fabrication. You start walking a line of inauthenticity to make up in you know, for insecurities in ourselves that we highlight through comparing to others when we really don't know what the deal is. You know, I, and I was insecure for many years. You know, in my 20s, I, building all the businesses I built was really out of response for trying to prove to the world I was good enough. You know, look, you know, well, will you love me now? Because now I have three companies. Or no, no, I still feel unloved, so now I'll build four companies. What about now? Am I good enough now? And if you're in that level, you know, I, I work with guys in, in the Middle East, in the Far East, that uh, it's worth $700 million that are miserable as hell because they're not a billionaire. You know, the, the, the goalposts keep moving. They're, they set the frame up. You know, to, to love yourself for where you're at, to be okay where you're at as a starting point and understand that everybody that where they are got to where they are from being where they were at. You know, there's no, there's no shortcuts. Everyone's on their own path. And whatever it is to identify and give your gift and it could be the ability to listen. It could be the ability to give advice at a certain time based on life experience that you thought was traumatic, you know, that now turns into being able to give something of value to others. It could be the fact that you, know, you have the ability to smile in situations that other people can't smile in you know, and pass that on. It could be the fact that you're, you're great at being able to rustle up food spontaneously. You know, as, uh, through having just thrown stuff together in the kitchen and, and make other people food right. that they didn't see they could. It doesn't matter. Whatever your gift is, you have a gift. Everybody's born with a gift. Now, looking at somebody else's gift and saying, oh, well, that needs to be my gift is a fast track to unfulfillment because you're always going to be frustrated. It, that. Well, it, and, it's, and it's, it, it is so pervasive and pernicious. I mean, yeah. I got to say, I'm, I'm living as a really sweet life right now. I mean, I have not been more peaceful and content and fulfilled as I am right now, maybe Beautiful. ever in my life. And yet, as soon as I got snared by, uh, by the comparing, man, I started to go down. So... It, that's how strong it is, that it could take me out of being as, as peaceful and fulfilled and content as I am and start me down that track. And again, yeah, our, our self-worth and our net worth yeah, remain tied at, at various levels unless we, we can um, stop sleeping awake. Yeah. yeah mo mo most people are sleeping awake. You caught yourself, which is great. But a lot of people are just unconscious when it comes to that because they're, they're so conditioned with 30,000 commercial messages a day telling them why they need to buy somebody else's crap in order to feel good enough. That's it. That's it. it and it's the habit. It's just, you know, and I was able to catch it because it was just an old habit that crept up. It was like, it's like, you know, stopping smoking. And after 20 years, somebody lights up a cigarette and there's a sense that says, oh, well, maybe I do want one. <laughs> yeah. It's just an old habit. And, and one of the ways I explain that, Chess, is that the mind is very similar to a compass needle. Yeah, it can only point in one direction at a time. Even if you have you know, women with their incredible diffuse awareness that can simultaneously do 50 things at once, their compass needle is simply pointing in different directions a lot quicker. 
Yeah, that mm. it's moving from one to the other to the other to the other, but it can only ever point in one direction at a time. Now, if you are walking around sleeping awake, as most of the population of fortune has been trained to do, then your compass needle will gravitate in the direction that it's most conditioned or most magnetized in that metaphor uh, towards. And most people, their biggest source of magnetism is the media yeah, and or their friend's opinion or mm-hmm. yeah, their, uh, why, why we can't. It takes a lot of self-conscious um, uh, discipline to say, you know something, I'm going to cut all that out and I'm going to start daily stroking my compass needle in a new direction. I'm going to magnetize it in a new direction. I'm going to point it consistently in a new direction, yeah, a positive, a possibility of how I can as to what's great about life. You know, because what's wrong is always available. If I ask you the question, what's wrong now, your brain's going to give me an answer. And if I ask you what's right, it's going to find me an answer. Both mm-hmm. are always available. That's not the deal. The deal is what would you rather choose to focus on and point your needle in the direction of on a consistent basis so that when you do you know, go back into habit, as we all do, you know, sleeping awake, walking around without being present, the compass needle is going to by default gravitate towards where it's been conditioned the most. Right. And that's why people say to me, they say, are you, you, you happy all the time? I say, well, yeah, ha- happiness is, is an emotion. It's a temporary emotion. We're not designed to be happy all the time as humans. You know, we're, there's a time to be happy. But am I fulfilled? Well, yeah. Uh, and the reason is I, I, I tried being unhappy and unfulfilled once, and I didn't like it. <laughs> yeah, well, why, why would I want to make that, why would I want to make that a, a default state? Yeah, and, and it can be as simple as that. They say that no one cares how much you know until they know how much you care. Peter Sage cares. He cares about helping people get the most out of this precious opportunity of life. He cares about making a difference. He cares about being honest and about seeking the truth and speaking to the truth of things. Now, is his truth necessarily my truth or yours all the time? No, it's not. Peter's got a lot of wisdom and advice and guidance, and he's not shy about sharing his perspectives. What makes his guidance accessible is that he has very little stake in whether you agree with a particular idea or not. First and foremost, Peter is happy to share his own vulnerabilities and challenges so that we might accept our own as just a part of living out a human life. It can be hard to find the authentic balance between humility and true confidence. Peter seems to have found a nice blend. Where, Peter, do you still get lost? Where do you still get trapped, triggered, you know, where you need to catch yourself? And, and what is it that brings you back? Uh, that that's a great question. I uh, I have to say that in in normal day to day life, it's very difficult for me to get emotionally hooked into you know, the, the sort of story um, because I see it as a as a byproduct or consequence of my previous thoughts. You know, life on the in the outer world follows the inner world, but there's a delay. Yeah, it's just the what, what's called the, the quantum to Newtonian transition point. Yeah, and it could be depending on, on the, the quality of signal you're broadcasting and how aligned you are. It could be anywhere from you know, sort of uh, a few moments to around about eight weeks. But generally speaking, most people's circumstances of their life reflect the quality of thoughts in their inner world over the last six to eight weeks. That's just, you know, we know that now in quantum physics. It's not even up for debate. Right. But, but from a, uh, so, so the outer world really hooks me. It rarely hooks me. I mean, yeah, we're we're still human. If there's one area that would probably magnify that more than anything other, it's probably in the area of personal relationships, intimate relationships. Mm -hmm. You know, you've got one plus one equals 11 there. And yeah, it could be minus 11 or plus 11 pretty quick, depending on on, on where you're at. So obviously living with somebody and I have my my fiance, Thea, we we recently got engaged. We're getting married next year. Yeah, she's the light of my life. And so being in a situation where you're in a personal relationship, that's probably far easier place to test somebody uh, who uh, can slip unconscious than, for example, a business deal. Yeah? So because you've got different levels of emotion involved. 
especially if your net worth and self-worth are unhooked, then, you know, if I lose a deal, I lose a deal. There's always another deal. But if you have a, a situation where you're dealing with people you really care about and there's, there's unconditional love on the table, and uh, then, yeah, that's easier for you to potentially get hooked. So sometimes, you know, we, you may catch yourself or, or theory and I may catch ourselves in a, in a situation where, you know, we snap or we're short or we're based on a reflection of the emotional state or exhaustion or, or whatever we're in or just you know, in a different box. Uh, but we very quickly catch ourselves. It's very rare that we'd, we'd go down a, a situation, especially with the women, because women are emotionally you know, diverse creatures. They're beautiful. That's what makes them who they are. The power of the feminine is always in motion. It's like nature. It's the weather. You know, one minute it's a calm, you know, wonderful you know, kickback on a tropical island. Next minute it's a freaking hurricane for no reason whatsoever. We love them for that. Yes. Now that, that's, that's the nature of the feminine, learning to appreciate the beauty of the weather rather than complain if there's a storm, rather than appreciate the flowers that love the rain, is, is something that you know, a lot of men, unfortunately, aren't aware of, and, and they miss that aspect, so they, they get into fix-it mode but, or run away. But yeah, from, from my side, what keeps, me, um, uh, what keeps me on my toes is definitely more the personal aspect of the relationship right now. That's what forces me to stay present. Mm. And if, if I find myself being sucked in, I have to remind myself, whoa, you know, stay present, send love, be, be you know, in the space or learn to be in the space of uncertainty around that and come from the right place. And the weather usually will sort itself out. Right. And do you have any practices around that? Do you have practices that, that, that return you to? Because, you know, we, we often know what is the, the, the mindset that's going to get me back. But to we, we, achieve we some, that mindset yeah. can be difficult. <laughs> we, we have some code words. Hmm. And so, you know, if we find ourselves getting sucked into a, a, a bit of a, a negative whirlpool, one of us will usually call a code word. And that, uh, that's usually for us to take a couple of minutes out, come back to love, come back to presence, recognize that it's not about us. It was just about the emotional pattern that was running at the time and remind ourselves why we're here. Now, sometimes, depending on how much you've already been sucked into the whirlpool, that, that, <laughs> you know, that, that, that rope may not reach down. Right, but uh, but yeah, that's part of being human. Yeah, it's, it's part of the game. As long as you can come afterwards and not carry that level of resentment, but have the ability to turn your past into wisdom and see where you can learn from that, or why did I get hooked so badly, and what was really going on, and yeah. ask yourself better questions rather than sit with the surface level of story and blame the other person or beat yourself up because you didn't you know, do this or that. Then yeah, there's always room for, uh, for for lessons out of that. Very much the witnessing, the actual witnessing. Okay, what's really happening here? And, yeah. And I heard a wonderful quote by um, uh, Michael Brown, who wrote the uh, Presence Process, and it's it's that drama occurs when we ask others w- to give us what we haven't learned to give to ourselves. Beautiful. I love that. You know, and so oftentimes that's the case. You're not you're not showing up or responding in the way that makes me feel safe, secure, loved. You know. Uh, worthy and then it's like oh that's right it's not your job to to make me feel that way yeah you know it's it's a bonus when people smile back at you in that but if it's your only source of of feeling loved uh then then we're kind of done for we've again abdicated our our responsibility to someone else 100 percent. You, you cannot give that which you don't have mm, yeah you've traveled all around the world and uh and i know you do so much charity work and uh and you know building resources for uh, impoverished uh, communities. And I'm wondering, Peter, what have you learned uh, that's been the most uh, impactful for you from those, the the people who live in in such uh, impoverished circumstances uh, and are succeeding nonetheless, you know, and are still living life in, in, in vibrantly? I, I love that question. And there's, there's much to be learned when you come from a place of what other people would perceive abundance and you go to places that other people then perceive as squalor and you see what's real. You know, I, a few weeks ago, I was in Gugaletu in Cape Town, one of the, the, the poorest townships and slums. And, you know, I was, um, uh, we do a lot of work in South Africa with the Mandela Legacy Foundation. We're actually officially partnered with the Mandela Legacy Foundation uh, across South Africa in teaching education and entrepreneurship and, and resourcefulness. So I get to see and spend time in places like Soweto uh, or, you know, I've, I've spent time in, in remote areas of Kenya in like Bongoma working with orphanages. And and, and I, I do it to, to keep my feet on the ground and remind me what to be grateful for myself because these kids can teach us so much about what's really 
uh, the, the true meaning of happiness and fulfillment. You know, they're, they're, they're so happy because, you know, it rained yesterday. They're so happy because, you know, they found something that they can kick around that we would throw in the trash and they can now have a game. And yeah, so there's a lot of, there's a lot of reminding about what's real and what's, what it means to get off the chasing the more, uh, as I call it. You know, most people are, are so unhappy because they're chasing the more and the more always runs faster than us. You take somebody like Nelson Mandela. Yeah, you know, arguably one of the greatest living you know, leaders of the 20th and 21st century. And what, what Nelson Mandela did, and I spend a fair bit of time with his family, uh, and having this conversation is so true. You can get people to say, look, I've got all these resources, and I, I want to contribute, and they go out and start building home projects in Mexico or building schools in, you know, I've, I've built schools in Tanzania. And, and that's all well and good. But Nelson Mandela didn't build one school. Now, he didn't donate money to, to charities, yet he influenced and impacted far more millions of lives than anybody I know that's gone off to Mexico building homes. And the way he did it was by being the example, it was by coming from a place of demonstrating unconditional love, demonstrating what's possible for the human spirit, regardless of being you know, incarcerated for 27 years, was to be able to forgive the people that put him there. You know, to be able to touch so many people's lives in a positive way and empower people from that place, not just because they've, you, know, you, you contributed some money to build a house, mm. uh, was, was a huge learning for me. You know, to, to be able to walk your truth at the highest level of service because you own yourself with no apology, because you see unconditional love where other people see conflict, where you come from a place of, of not having to you know, marginalize or be divisive to make tough calls, but make tough calls from a place of love, not tough calls from a place of political position. Uh, and to see that he was one of the, the few statesmen that, that actually came from a, a sovereign level of statesmanship, whereas most politicians, unfortunately, these days, it's not about, you know, politics is not about statesmanship anymore. It's about positioning. It's about you know, how do I seek election and then seek to retain uh, that position four years from now by doing what's popular, not what's you know, risking being unpopular for the greater good, as we spoke about earlier. Yeah. So, so doing a lot of the, the work around Africa and, and being as close to the Mandela you know, family as, as I've been fortunate enough to be, you know, seeing the evidence of that, seeing how one person out of prison came and and united a country that was on the verge of civil war and everybody expected him to come out and and, and was praying you know the, the the vast majority of the population the colored population was saying you know please just say the word now it's our turn right you know, you've, you've screwed us over for so many years now it's payback and he knew that that would be a powder keg he didn't come out of that level of consciousness. He came out one man calibrating at a level of unconditional love and forgiveness that transformed and united a country. Not about race and division, but about the identity of being the rainbow nation. We're all part of the rainbow. Yeah. And from that place, let's bond together in unity to be able to build a country we can all be proud of. And that was, was incredible. That's one man being able to demonstrate a level of, of power, integrity, regardless. And we see it in, in America, Martin Luther King. You know, standing up for what he believed in from a place of unity, unconditional love, uh, and not willing to be uh, at the base of being you know, divisive, you know, nonviolent um, uh, opposition like Gandhi. And you see these people that created uh, this space for millions of people to have hope and take themselves out of poverty without having to run around and donate to charity or, or do a, a fundraiser or build a house or, or what have you. So I've, on, on that side, it's been a, a real eye-opener doing the charity work that I've done. And there's nothing wrong with going out and contributing and putting a school over some kids' heads. You know, that's, that's fine. But real impact comes from symbolic action from a place of you being 1,000% truthful to who you are and standing up for what you believe to be the greater good. And, to, and it's so... Um pernicious the the ability of status and wealth and power to start to blind people to their original core values if they if they haven't really um asked themselves the powerful questions of what do i believe in and what's the most important to me and i find it astounding that that typically it is those who have had everything taken away from them who really find the power of their truth? Hundred percent. Yeah, that, that's that, that's a, a great leveler. You know, the, the, it's the famous quote. You know, true wealth is who you are when you've lost all your money. Yes. Yeah. And from 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 that side, 
you, know, you can start to get in touch with what is real. Bearing in mind that the only place in the universe that, that money actually means anything is in the mind of men. Nothing else keeps track of it. Yeah. Same, exactly the same as time. What would that look like to you, Peter? You're, you're, you're so everything's stripped away. Um, well, you're back to ba- you're back to basic essence, and and you've cultivated a real sense of what's important to you. It's about being able to contribute that. M- money is a byproduct or a consequence of, of you adding value. Otherwise, mm. you're sitting there you know, in the gym saying, "Wow, give me the strength, I'll go lift the weights." Mm-hmm. Uh, that doesn't work. Uh, but it's also understanding something else, Chess, and, and this is it. I, I told you I was, we're just on tour in South Africa, and and uh, my lady Thea, she was she, we were off swimming in one of the rivers. We did a tour of the Eastern Cape, some of the backwaters and, and, and little places that not many people go. And we were stopping and swimming in these incredible rivers and, and lakes and canyons, and, and and we got out, and all of a sudden she looked down. She said, oh my goodness, she'd lost one of the stones out of her engagement ring. And yeah, it's quite a, uh, an intricate ring. Yeah, I'm very proud. I designed it myself. It, you know, Tiffany's in New York and it's, it's, it looks great. And it's a symbol mm. of, of, of my connection to her. But one of the stones was missing. And she got all upset and panicky and she was wondering what I was thinking. And I'm like, well, honey, you've got to understand something. It wasn't yours in the first place. She's like, well, what do you mean? You gave it to me. <laughs> and I'm like, well, yeah, I, I don't mean it's somebody else's. I mean, yeah, that, that stone's been around for 20 million years. You know, that stone's going to be around for another 20 million years. What made you think you owned it? Mm. Yeah, and, and money, if we see the fact that money is something we own, we start taking on a positionality. Whereas recognizing that we're just custodians of it. You know, whatever money's in my bank is not mine. We're just custodians of, of what we currently you know, have access to or control of at the moment. Just like your kids, you don't own your kids. Yeah, right. You may be responsible for them until they're 18, legally, but mm-hmm. you don't own them. Yeah, so yeah, that you, you you don't own the money you have; you're just a custodian of it, which allows you the best way to bring it up and utilize it. Uh, and so, for me, for you know, if I lost everything tomorrow, it'd be a damn good excuse to go again. And the, the river always winds, so let's see where what's going around the next bend. That's the journey. Yeah, you know, you're never going to take it with you. No, so, you, you, so you. What's the score? Yeah. You know, the, the only people that tried that were who? The Egyptians. And what <laughs> happened? Yeah, we we dug it up and stole it. <laughs> that's true this is true and they, 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 they there's a quote that says you never see a luggage rack on a hertz exactly you know on a hearse you know right. taking you to the to the to the graveyard this is it's not going to happen so you know what why get all, all fussed out over it you know if if my path in life my truth is to have the reset button pressed right now financially it's because yeah there's something that i'm i'm looking to take on which is a different position uh, and let's be honest what's the worst thing that can happen in, in this day and age you can't starve to death yeah try it they'll force feed you <laughs> yeah, there's, you know, there's, we're living in a time with so much certainty around that but some mm-hmm. people are, um, so many people are miserable because they've got their self-worth and net worth tied together and they believe that you know money is this conceptual thing you've got to chase after like chasing after the strength before you lift the weights right. yeah that's not that's not going to work and accumulating and, it and accumulating and it and accumulate, rather than right. being a let it moving through us exactly yeah. you know utilize it correctly allow it to flow and you'll start to see that more come, you know, more, more comes. Mm. You know, there's, uh, and that's not just a go away and tithe. And, and you know, there's a lot, there's a lot of, you know, there's, there's a lot of truth to that. You, you have, money will grow if you utilize money correctly. And there's so much information around now. It's there's no excuse to be financially illiterate. You know, 50 years ago there was no internet. There was no, you know, you, you, you had to get access to different levels of mentorship and uh, and custodian around money. But now there's too much information. Tony Robbins just wrote a, a brilliant book, Money Master the Game. You know, you've got, uh, got you know, Robert Kiyosaki. Uh, there, there's so many people now that teach you. Right back to the basics of The Richest Man in Babylon by George S. Clayson, written in the 1930s. Beautiful book that teaches you everything you need to know about how to manage money as a psychology of wealth. Yeah, there's, there, there's enough information around there for people to stop making the excuse that they think they're not enough because they don't have enough. Right, right. Which then brings us perhaps back to the idea that with all that information out there, you know, why do people still get so stuck? And it really is around the myth that their, that their worth is tied to their abundance. Absolutely. As I right. say, you know, yeah. g- g- give up the game. You yeah. know, who, who you are is way more than anything you will ever have. What would you say from your travels and um, and all the the, the different uh, organizations that you that you have connection with and the different populations that you encounter? 
What are you seeing as being to you kind of the most inspiring change that you see happening in the world, whether it be uh, physically what's happening in the world in, in the ways that people, uh, uh, you know, uh, are, are engaged with each other or in mindset and in, in understanding and consciousness? What's inspiring well, you the most? It has to be around the area of opportunity and barrier to entry. You know, mm. I, on, on, on the Millionaire Business School, three days, I teach people how to start a business with no money, how to double their business without spending money, how to create an army of raving fans, all of which is so much easier today than it was even five years ago. You know, the amount of technology that's around now means that you can get a, a kid in, in the slums in Mumbai uh, yeah, that can create a million-dollar business you know, from a smartphone. And that's never been available in human history. So the, the, the fact that the opportunity is there, the fact that we have so much instant access to knowledge, uh, and the, ch the challenge, obviously, with that is that you know, most people are, are drowning in information and starving for wisdom. You know, it's, it's about being able to find the right kind of knowledge to be able to apply that. But you know, we now have a choice. We're living in a time in, in human history where we can choose where we want to live for the vast majority of people. You know, you, you, want to, you want to improve your life, improve the people who you hang around with. And we now have that choice, whereas before we didn't. It was always either the village or the, the school or what have you. No, we now have a choice of who we want to hang around with, whether it's online or whether it's offline. And that's such an exciting prospect because we can now can choose to align ourselves with the people who inspire us or you know, go and set up the game in order to win rather than think we've just been dealt a certain hand we can't chop in. Yeah, you know, that's such a powerful perspective because it's so true. You know that yeah, if you're if you were born in a village and that's that's it, that's your culture. Those are your peers. Those are the people who are going to be feeding you information and that you're going to be learning from. And if it's if it's you know uh, uh, not serving you in any way, it was really hard to escape that. Yeah. Now 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 say you you can be in Sierra Leone, have access to to the internet, and be able to listen to incredible podcasts like yours, Chess. I mean, mm. it, the world's the limit. Yeah, very much so. I was looking on your on your site, and um, there's there's a lot of really valuable content there, Thank you. and and I recognize that you've got a lot going on. Uh, <laughs> what is and so so in that there has to be the sense that not all of it, not all of your uh, you know what you share and how it's laid out and and how it's all put together. There's no way that it's all perfect, right? Of course not. <laughs> right. So what trumps perfectionism for you in regards to, you know, getting information out there that, you know, maybe it's got some holes in it. Maybe it's not perfect, but at least it's out there. You know, how do you view that? What, what trumps perfectionism? One word, authenticity. Mm. If it's true for you and you're not addicted to it having to be right for somebody else and you're okay with that, then get it out. You know, perfection is the lowest standard because it's unattainable. Yeah. And for everybody that, that tries to be perfect, guess what? Nobody else really cares. They're too busy being worried about what they think you're thinking of them. Well, there it is. So, right, because I'm on your website and I'm, and I'm, I'm looking and I'm saying, oh, yeah, there's a typo here. Or there's a, you know, oh, there's, here's I listen to a snippet of one of your audios and I'm thinking, oh, do I really align with that fully? Do I think that that's the absolute truth? And there was no sense of me that, that was in, uh, thinking, oh, well, Peter's less than because I don't agree with all this. There was just yeah. a sense of, right on, man, here's somebody out there who's just doing everything he can to be authentic and speak whatever truth makes sense to you in service to others. And how can that be impeached? Yeah, exactly. And yeah, life's a buffet. Yeah, and you're going to have some people that prefer meat, some people that are vegetarian, some people that like dessert, and some people that don't. Yeah, and, and so go take what's valuable to you on your terms, apply it, and taste it. And if you don't like it, spit it out. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> no, 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 no one's going to judge you for that. Right. Yeah, and if they do, then yeah, those that mind don't matter, and those that matter don't usually mind. Mm. Yeah, yeah. You've got a new book coming out, yes? I have. And it's called I Am? I am the, the power of reinventing yourself, and yes, very excited. We're in the in the advanced stages of finalizing the manuscript, and again, not not wanting to be perfect at all by any stretch. But yeah, I always come up with yeah different ideas when I'm meditating that I want to try and fold in, and I don't want it to be too much to to too many people because that's not the purpose of the book. Mm. But it's really about a journey on how to live life on your terms. Mm -hmm. 
what what does that mean to you? I am. Is that a st- can that be a statement in and of itself? Does it need to be followed by something? What's your relationship to that? It's the ultimate statement because everything that comes after that is a choice, and most of us don't realize. You know, I am you know, uh, too fat. I am good looking. I am tall. I'm short. I'm beautiful. I'm clever. I'm smart. I'm dumb. All of the labels that come after that either have been given to us, and we forgot that they were Velcro instead of you know, uh, instead of super glue that we think that we we wear them around with, or you know, they're trying to make up for insecurities or trying to reach a goal that's unattainable. And until you can be comfortable with "I am," full stop, then you have freedom to choose your label. Then you have freedom to actually understand you know, that that is who I am. Yeah, just I am. Now, once, once you're there, then you know, everything else can stop. You know, the games, the drama, the, the positioning, the insecurities, the, the fantasies, the, all of that stuff. And you're free to choose you know, because our identity is the ultimate sense of how we behave. It's the ultimate sense of how we hold ourselves. Mm-hmm. Now, I am. Yeah, and there's a difference with that. It's a powerful process. You know, it, yeah, everybody has their sense of who they are. You know, I am you know, a smoker. I'm a non-smoker. I'm a, you know, a, a vegetarian. I'm a, a parent. I'm a, a, a coach. Uh, but those labels, consciously and unconsciously, govern our reaction way before the conscious mind jumps in. And it's what the unconscious then offers to the conscious mind really to choose from. Mm-hmm. So getting our identity right, or at least consciously being able to choose it, you know, I, I have a sense of, of who I used to be you know, on, the, on the business front. You know, I was a dynamic, unstoppable entrepreneur that you know, ate challenges for breakfast, let problems in a single bound, made money while I slept, and, and you know, changed the world for the, for the greater good. You know, that, that's, that was my sense of who I was as a business person. Now, that shifted. I now have a different sense of who I am. You know, I am... Uh, a divine and guided soul who acts as an open channel to God's wisdom, a powerful agent for positive change who was born to reveal the greatness in others. That's my statement on who I am right now. Yeah. And from, from that place, I lead a very different life. You know, I'm, I'm not chasing the, the, the do and doing 130 hours a week and building companies around the world and doing all that kind of stuff. Now I, I'm shifted. There's a different sense of purpose, different sense of grounding. And we have different say, you know, senses of who we are and I am throughout our life. It's okay, but consciously choosing that and being okay with the authenticity around it being your truth and not having to justify it to anybody else is where the power lies. And that's what the book is, is showing people on how to basically get to that place and use the, the rules of life as we know them at a, at a quantum level, at a spiritual level, at a practical level to be able to create life on your terms. What would you say, Peter, might be three really good questions that we can ask ourselves, whether it be every morning or sometime during the day or, you know, uh, just in, in, in our sense of awareness. One of the most grounding questions you can ask without a doubt is, what am I grateful for right now? Mm. You know, gr- gratitude gives a very different yeah, electromagnetic signature to virtually any other emotion other than unconditional love. And most people can't access unconditional love because they don't have a reference for it. Now, our earliest memory is conditional love. And you, you, you behave the way mommy and daddy want you to behave and you get rewarded. And if not, they use withdrawal of love uh, as, as a way to basically steer that level of behavior. And it's not right or wrong. It's just the, the model that you know, most of us grew up with. So the, the only thing it does, it, it doesn't give us a, a good reference for unconditional love. So gratitude is something that's far easier to access, which is why I tend to use that. But what am I grateful for? And if I ask the question, what, what are two things you were grateful for yesterday? Chances are you could answer that question. But the problem is we don't capture it. Mm. And and unless we spend time visiting that in the present moment, it's not going to condition the compass needle to point in the direction that is of service to us. So that that would definitely be a question. Uh, um, Another practical question I would ask is, what is my real outcome for what I'm about to do? Most of us get caught up in to-do lists. Most of us get caught up into, you know, uh, you know, what have I got to do next? And we, we come up with this stressful daily ritual or plan or, or what have you, or task list. Or, uh, and so 
uh, I tend to ask a better question. Asking a question, what is my outcome, will shortcut most of those to-dos into something that focuses you on the bigger picture. You know, to, be, to become outcome-focused rather than to-do-focused is, is a, a technique that you know, helps a lot with time management too. Absolutely right. Because then if I, if I know what my outcome is, now I can look at my to-do list and say, oh, to achieve that outcome, really, here's the priority that's going to you know, move me toward that in the most efficient, effective manner, rather than maybe these other five items that, yeah, need to get done, but they're not really going to help achieve this outcome that I've decided upon. Yeah. And uh, another question that I would ask for a third is, you know, what is most important to me in life? And am I doing, and is what I'm doing in alignment with that? Mm. And if it isn't, revisit. Yes. And, and part of what I'm hearing for you, Peter, is, is what is most important to you in life really is, is uh, centered around, revolves around the idea of giving back, of being of service. Is that, is that accurate? Absolutely. And, and walking my truth. And again, if, if, that, you know, if that serves people or whether it doesn't in the place they're at at that moment, that's, that's their journey. And I, I can love them for it and I can wish them well. And, and hopefully, you know, my intention is that they can take something of value out of that. But I'm, I'm not attributing my a sense of who I am to what they do with it. And that's a mistake a lot of teachers make because that's a measure of their learning, not my teaching. Mm. And so I divorce myself from the need to care about what my students do with that and i say that in a in an authentic way i don't say it from a blase you know i don't give a crap but of course i care otherwise i wouldn't be doing what i do but i can't allow myself to get sucked into what people do because their journey is their journey and i have no right to a impose my model of the world onto them and judge them for what they do or don't do uh, and b you know i have no right to to judge myself for where they're at on their journey and how my interaction or the fact that we cross paths uh, and whether they're better or worse for that is, you know, and, and how that affects me. So, you know, that, that's really where, where I sit with, with myself right now. And the more I withdraw from the need to impose that, paradoxically, the more messages I get from people who hopefully have been able to benefit. Yeah, need gets us in a lot of trouble. <laughs> that, that 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 sense of I need rather than yeah. I am enough and I just want. I want more. It, it, sure, I want more. I want sure I want more, more you know, fun, more engagement, more this, more that. But if it's if it's driven by a need, uh, that really gets us in trouble. Hundred yeah. percent. And if there was one phrase I could leave the the, the listeners with here yeah. that I would encourage them to tattoo on the inside of their eyelids, you know, and then on the inside of their heart, mm. it's it's coming to the truth that you already are that which you seek. There it is. There it is. And if nothing else, right? If nothing else, that is going to give us the most freedom. Because then you're free to go play and do what you want and make a million dollars or find the person of your dreams or what have you. But you're doing it from a place of now that that's something that you want to do because it's part of your passion, not because you need to do it to validate yourself and prove to your, your parents that you were worthy of the, the attention that your big brother got instead of you. Mm. Thank you, Peter. I always love the end of the interviews because it, it really always brings it down to, okay, what is it? You know, everything we've been talking about, what is the really core foundational understanding, belief, mindset that's going to, you know, hold it all together? And, and that's it right there. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I really appreciate you taking your time. Absolute pleasure, Chess. And again, yeah, thank you for giving me the opportunity and the medium to be able to express some of my thoughts to, to people that, you know, hopefully I'll get to meet one day or at least hear from and uh, in a way that you know magnifies my reach uh, through you. So you know, give yourself a pat for that too. Appreciate oh, thank it. Thank you. And I'm glad you're out there. And I'm really glad. One of my favorite phrases you used during the interview, oddly enough, was you said, there are many times I failed majestically. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Hey, if you're going to fail, yeah, do it in style. So for all, for all of your failures, for all of your successes, just for all of you and how you show up, thank you. I appreciate it. Pleasure. Much appreciated. See you later. All right. Thank you, Peter. To learn more about Peter Sage and his workshops and programs, and to take advantage of his many free gifts, visit him online at petersage.com. To work with me for personal or leadership development and mindfulness and presence guidance, or to attend a workshop or international retreat, visit chessedwards.com. You can listen to this episode again and to all of our interviews on iTunes and at our website, beyondthenoisepodcast.com.
www.thinkingdigital.com. I'm Chess Edwards, and this is Beyond the Noise, conversations at the heart of modern-day living.